It's 6 o'clock in London, it's 1pm in New York, 1am in Hong Kong, 3am in Sydney, 10am in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO Vid live stream, Series 8, Episode 4, that amounts to Episode number 46, starts here. Lots of exciting news this week in Exchange Invest Daily. You've got to be joining us every day by the newsletter in order to understand what's going on in the world of exchanges. But of course, one of the important stories of recent times has been COP26, the overall environmental side of the financial markets has been exploding after what we can see in terms of, well, this theme for today, the market view from COP26 with our guest, Steve Zwick. Steve's a former futures broker and traded in Chicago. Nowadays, Steve writes about the economics of sustainable development and the interplay between land use and climate change, two subjects he developed a fascination for during a 30-year career that brought him from Chicago's trading pits and led all the way to subsistent farms in rural parts of Kenya, Vietnam, and Brazil. As a journalist, Steve has worked for publications as diverse as the Chicago Reader, Fortune, and Time magazines. He's been twice shortlisted for the World Leadership Forum's prestigious Business Journalist of the Year Award and produced radio features for Germany's Deutsche Welle Radio, where indeed at one stage he was presenting, I do believe, a breakfast news show and national public radio in the United States of America. Steve... Good evening and welcome. Where in the world are you today? I'm in Rotterdam right now. Rotterdam, Netherlands. Wow. And how's lockdown going for you there? It's going fine. You know, we don't go out that much. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it's it's fine. If you, you know, you can go out to as many restaurants as you want, as long as you have your proof of vaccination and get out of there by seven o'clock. So it's fine. So therefore, it's great if you want to have an early evening. It's yeah. ideal. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of the fact that pathogens travel faster in the dark I, after I don't 7 get, p.m. Yeah, I don't get the logic of that either. They shuffle you out. There. I guess people get drunk, they get closer, they get more huggy and stuff like that. It, you know, the Dutch are warm, fuzzy people. <laughs> Well, it's, it's fascinating. It's great to see you all together today. Thank you very much for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've got a question for Steve about the exciting world of environmental finance and carbon finance, ping us a message wherever you're watching this, Facebook, LinkedIn or YouTube, and we'll be delighted to pass on your question to Steve. Hello, Simon Huckle. Thanks for joining us this evening amongst many other viewers. It's great to see you amongst our loyal cadre. So we're on the market view from COP26. Hold on a second. COP26, Steve, I mean, people, I think, have forgotten pretty much the better part of at least 15 to 20 of the previous 25 episodes. Can, can you try <laughs> and take us back a little bit to, to get us, where was the nascence of carbon trading, environmental finance? Yeah, I can go back before the first COP. It goes back, it starts in the, you go back to the 1970s when scientists first started to realize that, uh, that climate change was a looming issue and that um, that for and I focus on nature based solutions. So there was a paper that was written in the mid 70s, but um, called can Nate can trees get us out of it was I forget the name of the paper. It was written by uh, Freeman Dyson, well known uh, physicist who's still with us. And he basically said, if we can we if, if if climate change becomes a real serious issue, can we plant a bunch of trees to get us out of the mess? And he concluded that if you buy you, you can plant a bunch of trees to give buy some time until you do the industrial reduction. So that really became the genesis of, of carbon offsetting. And then by the end of the 70s, you had uh, the World Climate Conference in Switzerland, which is uh, where they really reached a global consensus on the fact that climate change was a threat that would probably have an impact by the end of the century and that, that uh, bad management of forest farms and fields was a key driver. So that, that, that goes back a long way. By 1992, though, that was the first time that we had the big global climate summit that was in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And then, then they decided to start, they created the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, and the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is a, an annual event where the leaders of the world get together and they sit down and they decide what is going to be the, you know, they, they, they're, you know, what's going to be the course for the next year. Um, over the course of the year, you have lots of other meetings going on, technical meetings and stuff like that. But the COP is the big one that comes at the end of the year. And by the time the COP comes around, 
there's been negotiations happening. Um, usually anything that's going to happen has already been mapped out ahead of the cop. You rarely see breakthroughs at the cop. Um, if you do see a breakthrough, it, it, it's, you know, because, because the negotiators have, um, they have, they have their marching orders and they have very narrow bands within which they can operate by the time they get there. But that's in a, in a, in a nutshell, that's what the cop is. And, uh, carbon trading goes back, uh, you know, the, the idea, if you look at the Kyoto protocol, that was when, I mean, it really goes back to the U S uh, if you look at, um, you know, Knox and Sox, nitrogen oxide and uh, sulfur, sulfur oxides in, uh, in um, acid rain in the early 1990s, there was a pretty successful program to reduce emissions by putting a cap on overall emissions and letting companies that, that achieved lower reductions, uh, you know, sell their, their allowances to other companies. So building on that success, when the Kyoto Protocol came along, they, had, they created something called the Clean Development Mechanism, which is a way for countries, you know, emitting companies in the developed world in Europe and the United States had mandatory caps. The developing world didn't because they really didn't have, you know, they weren't responsible for the emissions up to that point. So the, um, the clean development mechanism made it possible for companies in, say, Germany to offset their emissions by, by, financing a, a clean development program like a renewable energy project, a, a wind farm, solar, f solar field, or something like that in China or in India. And, uh, you know, they could then use that, um, you know, use, use that purchase towards meeting their, their, their commitments under, within the European Union, uh, within the European Union's uh, cap and trade program. Did I ex explain that right? Or ask, ask questions if there's anything fuzzy. I, well, let's take it back a step. So we, we started with Freeman Dyson, and he had yeah. this amazing paper, Can We Control the Carbon Dioxide in the Atmosphere? That's and the, the answer, I think, was a, a tentative, yes, we can, uh, without any Obama and legacy, they're, they're in or they're not in. But he was basically outlining those things. So you talk about NOx and SOx and acid rain that we get through, and those are all things that were actually hugely popular in the 1990s, but do seem to have kind of died out in a remarkable degree. And it's quite incredible what goes on. So therefore, I suppose the thing I would say is instantly, does that mean that market solutions really can help what's going on here? I think they can. I mean, some people would say they can't, but I think it's pretty clear that they can. Um, you know, if I think the, the problem is we haven't if you, I mean, if you look at California, they've managed to reduce their emissions by putting a cap on, on um, emissions within the state, letting people trade out of it. The, if you if you compare California to, to the Northeast, I think you also have a nice um, contrast because the Northeast was so obsessed with not having too high a price that they would release allowances in when prices got too high, and California didn't didn't do that, so they're they're able to have a more more of a driver. But ultimately. There's 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 two different um, there's two different approaches to what carbon markets can do, and I think that's also an important distinction because there's this. If you look at what Nordhaus wrote about uh, back, you know he you know he he also I, I should have mentioned him when I'm mentioning Dyson because he he came up with the idea of you know proposed carbon markets also back in the 70s and 80s. But if his idea was if you had a high carbon price, that would that would force companies to uh, make the kind of changes that they have to make to reduce emissions. And there's, there's a countervailing theory that, that is carbon offsets can help drive reductions in the most cost-effective mitigation outcomes. So if you're going to offset, you know, if, you, if you're in a sector that's very hard to abate and you want to offset your emissions by, by financing, say, renewable energy in another country or in the areas that I focus on by saving endangered forest or financing afforestation, reforestation. That's a way, that's a way of putting money into the most, into low cost, uh, cost effective, um, you know, way, ways of reducing emissions overall, while a high carbon price forces companies to make their own internal reductions. And you can have both. You can have a high compliance price covering a certain percentage of emissions, and then you can have a you can say if you want to go above and beyond this, you go into the voluntary markets, and there the focus is more on low-cost abatement. 
Very interesting. So you're talking there about, uh, I think it was William Nordhaus, and he was a man who was originally yeah. talking about carbon pricing really away 30, 40 years ago as well. Yeah. yeah. No. So, so you talk about these markets. I mean, there are multiple, it seems to me, variations on a theme of, of how these things uh, go. And let me just say, by the way, good evening, Simon Huckle. Thank you very much for your comment. It's a joy to see you as usual. Um, very well, thank you very much. We're enjoying, uh, well, propagating a little bit of hot air here, but we're hoping to save the, uh, the climate rather than doing it any endangered harm during the course of the next hour with my guest, Steve Zwick, giving us the market view from COP26. If you've got a question for Steve, ping it on over to me. We'll be delighted to uh, use it during the show. So, Steve, you talk about the multiplicity of markets. I I've got to say, I've been around the derivatives business as long as you have. We've been in all sorts of markets, all sorts of things. But the way the environmental markets, the way just the carbon market alone is put together, it really is... It's remarkably similar, but entirely different, I think is the only way I can summarize it easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's because the I mean, the compliance price varies by regime. So the price of EU ETAs, you know, European Union uh, emission trading allowances is a lot higher than the price in California, which is a lot higher than the price it, in Reggie, which is the northeast part of the U.S. So the, and those are three compliance markets and compliance markets means you're you have you're buying an offset in order to to meet a regulatory requirement. And the, the, or an allowance. I mean, the thing is, you have to differentiate too between allowances and offsets. Um, an allowance is issued by a government that says you have a. This is what you're allowed to emit based on different criteria and different regimes. It could be BTUs. It could be anything. Um, and then, and, and then you could also have a certain percentage of that being being an offset. And the 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 uh, the compliance price. Because it's it's a it's a it's kind of the, the the driver is commoditized. It's you you can deliver that to meet your compliance obligation no matter where you're at. That price is is uniform within each jurisdiction. Whereas a voluntary market is a whole different thing. Voluntary is when you're doing something above and beyond what's required by law, often by going into things that are maybe untested or new. So if you look at the voluntary markets, you have markets that are mature tested that have been evolving for 45 years, like like uh, Red Plus, which is reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. That's where you're essentially paying for conservation. And, and uh, you know, the, the carbon credits are generated based on a very complicated sequence of tests that you have to run to show what is the cost of doing nothing and, and what can you prevent. That's a fairly mature market. And so that there there are there is a convergence around prices. Um, but then uh, but then you, you could also have something like what's happened, some of the newer markets like kelp, kelp farming, where people are going in and growing big algae blooms or big kelp farms and then sinking them down into the bottom of the sea where they will sink into, in theory, they'll, they'll sink into the bottom of the ocean and become part of the, the seafloor and never come back up again. So that's a carbon capture and storage way of uh, approach. It, it's kind of an organic way. And then you have you have industrial carbon capture and storage where you have these machines like Climaworks and I think they're in Switzerland where they just suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and inject it into the ground. The cost on that is like $400 a ton, $300. I've seen varying prices. I, if I understand correctly in the U.S. with, with all the with energy subsidies, they can get it down to about $120 a ton. Don't quote me on that. But they, so you, you can go from $120 a ton on that down to... Um, down to like, uh, you know, right now, Red Plus is about $10 a ton. It was $5 a ton just a year ago. And then you also have a lot of renewable energy projects, which are super cheap now for an interesting reason. When, when, the, when the renewable energy projects were coming along a while back, there was an argument to be made that, that, that they needed that money to, to build these projects. As the economy, as the technology changed and and renewable energy has now become more mature, you no longer need that finance to pay for those. So they're kind of out of favor. They're, they're kind of, if you're a company and you're buying a, you, you buy a voluntary offset, you're doing it to get a corporate claim. You, you're doing it to sort of show that you did something. And if you, um, if you buy a renewable energy credit that people are arguing no one really needs anymore, it doesn't 
you know, the market doesn't need it to, to achieve anything. Uh, that's kind of, uh, it's, you're, it's not going to really give you the cachet in the market that you need. So those are super, super cheap and they're, and they're, they're not even going to be recognized under a lot of the carbon standards pretty soon. So that's fascinating. So you outline a picture of regionalism, subsidy is there, which let's face it is something we know about in, in a lot of a lot of other markets. I mean, one of the reasons why, for example, rice futures are yeah. not more successful is simply because there's actually so much subsidy goes into rice, particularly in Southeast Asia, that it's one of those old-fashioned Panamit Kakensis bread and games kind of pieces of politics where everybody's very, very concerned about the cost of the rice husk. That leads to, obviously, a lot of confusion, I think, in terms of how people are, are, are viewing what goes on with, with the whole business of pricing. Yeah. And then you say, you know, there's the voluntary market, and then there's essentially these markets where they're giving allowances, and then you've got the markets. Now, the EU, for example, the EU's auctions, they're auctioning allowances, right? Yeah, they're auctioning allowances and... Um... You know, I'd have to. I think there's there used to be offsetting in there under the CDM. They used to allow CDM in, and I should know this. I don't know if they do. I've been focusing so much on the voluntary market. I I don't know if there's any any kind of um, CDM type stuff in there. But there could, you know, going going forward, there, you know, with with Article Six, that's a definite possibility. And I didn't know what Article Six was. <laughs> that's that's an obvious question. What <laughs> is Article Six, Steve? Tell okay. all. Article Six is it's Article Six of the Paris Agreement, and you know when this was uh, it was when the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, and um, Article Six is the part dealing with international carbon. International. It's it, technically it deals with international cooperation towards reducing um, emissions. And it has three components, two of which are market-based, one is non-market-based. And because it, the, the idea is that if you, if you mar markets are a way of cooperating. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a German company, Daimler-Benz, and you can help a, con a company like you know, Namibia reduce its emissions by financing land use there, you're, there you have two, you know, two, you have cooperation towards a reduction. And Article 6 uh, was passed, it was, the article itself was enshrined in the Paris Agreement, but the rule book was delayed until just this year in Glasgow. Uh, they, you know, when they, they passed the Paris Agreement, it had 29 articles, and then when we, the, each article had to have rules for implementation. And the, I mean, and this is a long, I mean, this goes back, it was, again, decades of rulemaking so by the time the paris agreement came along every article sat on top of hundreds of agreements so most of the articles were written but when we got into uh katuichi where we were supposed to finalize the 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 rule book for all of the articles article six became a real sticking point uh mostly because of the complexity of international transfer they call them inter internationally transferred mitigation outcomes uh itmos is the word so and it, it goes to the this um, dichotomy or this, this distinction that I drew earlier between voluntary markets and compliance markets. Uh, if if you're a um, <clears throat> if you're if, if a company in in say Germany uh, wants to purchase an international offset in order to meet its compliance requirements in Germany, then and it, it wants to buy it from you know I'll, I'll stick with Namibia. Um, they, 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 the, um, the only way they can buy an offset from Namibia to meet their compliance requirement in Germany is to have a corresponding adjustment, meaning Namibia will take, will, will the, the government of Namibia has to keep a carbon accounting. They, they have a carbon inventory and they have to say, okay, we are going to allow this mitigation outcome to transfer to Germany. This means that even though we within Namibia have reduced our our, our emissions by, you know, say, you know, 10, 10 million tons, whatever. I mean, it's a lot more than that. But if we, whatever we've reduced it by, we then deduct that emission reduction from what we transfer. So we then add those emissions back to our inventory. We, we have no longer, we no longer have credit for this. So when it comes to the year on climate talks, we can't stand up there and say, we reduced our emissions this much. That's gone. Germany can say we reduced our emissions that much. That's a corresponding adjustment. 
And the question is, when do you apply them? When do you not? There's a, a couple, there's, you know, there's a, you know, it, 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 the, the complexity came in because there's two different market regimes within Article 6. There's Article 6.2 and 6.4. 6.2 is bilateral trades between countries. So that's the one I just described, Germany and Namibia. 6.4 is the, is the successor to the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism. The CDM was a centralized market. It was a, you know, it was a bottom-up creation, and they set the rules and the standards and everything else. And in under 6.4, the UN um, will 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 also create a centralized hub for trading if companies countries want to use it. And there could be so smaller countries might not have the capacity to develop their own markets. Uh, you know, on 6.2, countries can they can create their own rules. They have they have there's there's meta rules that they have to follow, but but they can create a lot of their own their their own rules for for dealing bilaterally with each other. 6.4, you're going to have UN based rules that that anybody who wants to go through the hub has to follow. Um, and th this issue of corresponding adjustments was a really sticky issue within 6.4 for a couple of reasons. One was you had you, you had um, a lot of these old CDM offsets still kicking around, a lot of older ones, some of which are questionable because they were in that early phase where there was a lot of pilot stuff going on. And remember earlier I mentioned India, Brazil, China, that, that wasn't just hypothetical. Those were the countries and South Korea, they, they produced the most CDM offsets. So the, these countries had already in, in produced a lot of offsets and they had these things sitting there. And it's like, you know, they're just going to disappear or can we use them in the next regime? So that was a big part of it. Um, and then also Brazil wanted a grace period for for doing corresponding adjustments, which is a little bit shaky because, you know, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Um, there's a there's a third uh, a third um, complicating element, which is these which is other other markets like Corsia, which is international flights. What happens to those? You trans, you know, you, you pay into that. It doesn't go from one country to another. It goes from one country into the airline industry, which is and considered it's not part of and shipping too. It goes into a, sectors that are that are that are international, not not cross border. So that was one of the complexities. And then there was another. Um, I forget what I had already mentioned and what I didn't. So let me let me see what was the the oh the, let's see what corresponding oh yeah the the third was we mentioned voluntary markets. What what happens on voluntary markets if if i'm a company again going back to my to my uh my my um example before if i'm a german company and i want to buy an offset from a, a land project a for a reforestation project in namibia um do can i um can i then do, does namibia have to do a corresponding adjustment if i'm a if i'm a german company buying it not not necessarily because i if i'm a german company and I'm only using it for a voluntary um, statement that doesn't impact my national accounting. Would that be counted? I, it gets, did I explain that right? Or uh, I can't hear it at this point oh, in they, time. Oh, yeah. uh, oh, yeah. Hashtag it's complicated at this point in time. That, that's where I am. So, so <laughs> if I understood this correctly, if Germany did their trades the right way with Namibia at some point in time, everybody in Namibia would be back in the mud huts and essentially Germany would have greened the whole country, including the desert, because <laughs> they had all their offsets against them. Is that, is that, a, is that a plausible outcome? If, yeah, if, if it was a compliance credit. And that's one reason you haven't seen that many trades. You know, they're, they're, the companies aren't really using international um, carbon offsets uh, you know, for compliance purposes right now. There doesn't seem to be a lot of demand. And there was a fear that the same thing would happen with the voluntary market. Because again, if you're if if the if in the voluntary market, if I'm Daimler Benz and I want to go beyond what the German government is requiring, if I want to do that by financing mitigation projects in, in Namibia, um, I can do that in the under under Article six now under the rule book, uh, Namibia doesn't have to make a corresponding they can require a corresponding adjustment. And there's reasons they might want to do that. But but generally speaking, they don't have to require it. And what happens is that if I, the question is, what can Daimler Chrysler claim? Can they claim, can they say they're, they're carbon neutral? That That's what they've been saying up until now is if you, that they were carbon neutral. Now it's like, maybe they can't say that. Maybe there's going to be a change on what they can claim, but, but, and it would be something along the lines of, 
you know, we reduced our footprint or our impact by fight, by helping Namibia reduce its emission reductions. There, there's a lot, there's a whole other group going on about that. That's, that's focused on what kind of claims can we make? That's, you know, under the, under the, these various task forces that exist. Okay, so so we got a cornucopia of task forces, and I do believe actually you have been or are on one of the major task forces as well. Yeah, I was on the uh, the scaling voluntary market. Jeez, I, voluntary market. I forget what it's called. <laughs> the scaling the the task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets, um, and that was the first one. That's no longer. It's not around anymore. It served its purpose and it moved on. And the goal there was the, this. There was uh, an, a, an, an awareness. This was co convened by Mark Carney, um, and the, there was an awareness that we needed to dramatically scale up voluntary carbon markets to about 15-fold um, if we're going to if they're going to meet the you know the the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And they needed to have everybody on the same page. And uh, they 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 there were you had various carbon standards that had evolved over the years and. I'd say they were pretty much on the same page, but there was there was you had banks coming in, you had you had companies making claims, you had there was a big fear that it was just going to run away from everyone if we didn't get everyone together. So the, you know through through a period process that lasted about a year or so, um, we we just uh, we got they got every I mean they really had a big tent, and I think we reached agreement on on a lot of key issues and issues that couldn't be reached were passed on. They created new new task force. And one of them is um, the Voluntary Markets Integrity Group, I think is what they just changed the name of it. But it's that is the one that's focused on what kind of claims can you make. And there is there are still now there are governance bodies and stuff that are designed to kind of, you know, create, you know, to to create, um, uh, you know, regimes, you know, have, have, you know, governance bodies comprised of standards and regional regulators. And then you, you have you know, uh, it's 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 like it's, it's a lot like the futures associations. You know, you have different, you have self-regulating entities working together with regulatory bodies to create some kind of global standards. But the big one going forward is going to be more there because there's the market integrity, which is can you say that the reductions that are being claimed are really there? And I think that's a question of just making sure the standards are doing their job, making sure that the verifiers are independent. A lot of issues that have always been around. And then the other one is can you can you say that the what kind of corporate claims are being made? And that's going to be tricky because, you know, you don't want to have companies thinking they can just go out, buy a bunch of offsets and say, we don't have to reduce. Um, and they're, they're, they're like, at what point can a company say they're carbon neutral? Okay. So, so there's obviously, there's a huge amount to be done, but it's a very, very fast moving market and it's still in an elementary state. One of those things which I think is interesting is actually let's go to we've got a question from a woman on it to go down to the micro level at the start. Good evening, Steve. Hello, woman on it. It's lovely to see you as well. Good evening, Steve. What is your suggestion for a small company that wants to make a sensible and impactful climate pledge? Yeah, that's it. It all depends on the company. Uh, you know, that's. Um... I mean, they, they, I think for all companies, the same thing applies, which is first, you know, reduce, you know, look to where you can reduce your emissions and what you can't reduce, you look to offset. And when you look to offset, make sure you're offsetting with a credible program. Um, it, it, you know, so depending on the industry you're in, uh, you know, if you, if, you know, so yeah, it, it really depends really on what, what, what sector you're in, but you, you know, if you can find ways to eliminate immediately, do it. Um, and then I'd say, you know, uh, try to come up what you can't eliminate immediately, set time bound targets, especially, you know, let your customers know that's very important that we, you know, we, we plan to be at, at net zero. That's actually something too, I should point out. You try to decide if you want to be carbon neutral or net zero. Um, the difference is subtle net zero is where we all have to be and you know by 2050 or so and if you net zero means you've eliminated all of the um what they call absolute emissions that you possibly can you know you switch to renewable energy you're you you know whatever your sector is and if you're a farmer you're you know you're using you're growing your own fuel you're you're using switch crops and cover crops you're doing there's all these different things that anybody can do uh you're doing you're doing all of that now you're only offsetting the remainder and you're only offsetting with 
removals. There's two different kinds of offsets. It, gets, it does get complicated. Um, redu reductions and removals. Um, you know, and that that's a big debate too. Because we at, by the end by the end state when we're at at net zero, we have to be the only offsets really that are viable are removals because at that point we've uh, theoretically achieved all the reductions we can. In the short term, though, it doesn't matter if 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 we don't reduce, we're going to have to you know we're going to have to pull it back down anyway. So think about what you want to do in terms of an offset strategy too. You you have to have an internal reduction strategy. You need an offset strategy. Try to see if it aligns with your business. If you're in agriculture, look at land-based offsets. If your if your company has a lot of industrial emissions, look at look at um, you know I I I'm a big fan of uh, of uh, land nature-based solutions because uh, they're they're so important. They have so many co-benefits, and uh, you know they they they're something we can do now. But some would argue that if you're in the industrial sector, you you should offset your emissions with industrial offsets. Um, if you if 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 your business is uh, lucrative enough, or if your reductions are low enough, look into really high end offsets like carbon capture and storage, but be prepared to pay for it. Fascinating. So actually, already we got woman on it saying thank you, Steve. Always great to hear a sensible and coherent approach. Never heard or understood uh, the net zero concept. I think you've explained that very very neatly. Now we've got another question came in from a LinkedIn user. We can't see their username. It seems there's a cornucopia of prices for <laughs> carbon. Can we reach a single world benchmark, Steve? You know, that's that's the big debate right now. Um, that's it, one one of the goals of the voluntary the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets was to first achieve what they were calling a core core carbon principles, and then based on that, find a contract, a market based approach to delivering a global reference, a global benchmark for voluntary carbon. And, um, you know, it's theoretically possible, but it's really, really hard to do because they're so different. I mean, and, and, you know, I, yeah, it's, it's, we, I mean, I sat around on calls with people a lot better educated on this and, you know, and economics than I am. And, uh, nobody agreed on this. I think the, the thing is, if you look at, if, if you look at a, 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 a and a forest, a tree planting project, or 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 a, a red plus project, you know, and you look at all the co benefits, and you look at the costs, I mean, because that's the thing too, the cost of reducing emissions can be pretty high in in certain cases, um, and 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 a lot of times there's the the co benefits are really high too. By co benefits, I mean if it's let's say you have an indig indigenous tribe uh, that is using carbon markets to keep out illegal loggers, that's a red plus project, you know, they are. They're also giving women an opportunity to develop their 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 livelihoods. They're they're providing um, income for their people. They're developing lots of alternative income strategies. The co benefits on that are so so high, and they're so intertwined with with the carbon benefit. Can how can you link that out? And with, with, there's this theory out there that you, if we could find a core carbon price, make it a market dri market driven one, then you can have something like the the commodity markets where you might you you have a core price and then you have you know okay okay here, here's a core carbon price now oh they do biodiversity too we add that on and oh they they uh you know they're 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 uh you know they're they're improving the water quality we can add that on too and add these in in, in theory it sounds great but i just don't you know i i vacillate on that every day there is a group i i've got this little token here that was given to me in in um in uh at Glasgow, and this is one of the exchanges is creating a um, is creating a a uh, tokenized. They're, they're they're creating a basket of commodity of, of, of different. Um, they're taking a basket of different um, offset prices and creating a single price with a weighted average. So, and then you can buy this token that is a a volunteer that symbolizes one ton of emission reduction. There's another exchange, CPL. Is taking a different approach. What they're doing is they're taking different types of of offsets, and then they're 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 also creating a basket. But instead of creating like tokenizing it, they're make they're saying that the lowest available um, offset is 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 the you know is, is the lowest deliverable is the one that you can you can use. But that takes the in both of these it takes the individuality out of these. What when people are buying offsets from land use and from charismatic projects, the story is so important. They want to know who the people are 
and because and every one of these 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 tribal projects has such an amazing story. I mean, it's I can I, if I get started on this, uh, we'll 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 run out of time pretty quick. They're pretty amazing. Well, that, that sounds like that sounds like a great topic to move on to later. I mean, air carbon exchange. That's really interesting because in fact. We're going to be coming back and meeting with Air Carbon Exchange in January, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have an IPO vid devoted to that. Now, one of the things that's gone on in the last week, Steve, and maybe you can help me here because I really am a bit of a carbon derivatives idiot or a bit of a carbon auction idiot is the Intercontinental Exchange. They made this huge announcement last week. They're going to host carbon credit auctions for Permian Global. Permian Global are a leading developer of large scale tropical forest protection restoration projects. Now, what they said in the thing was, we're going to take a leap forward for the first time into having a global carbon price. So I got very excited about that <laughs> and exchange invest. And I said, well, this is absolutely wonderful. It's incredible. No sooner did I do that than the, the good folks of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange <laughs> on behalf of Expansive CBL, who they have a shareholding in, were saying, well, I think it's important to call you out because you're wrong, Patrick. Now, I'm quite happy to admit I'm wrong at, at well, various points in time I'm wrong, given the fact I produce 250 newsletters a year and do goodness knows how many trades and investments. I mean, I'm wrong quite frequently, actually. So I'm curious, walk me through this. Not a question of am I right or am I, am I wrong? What are the similarities? What are the differences in terms of what the, the Permian Global Auction brings to the Intercontinental Exchange and their plans? What is the CME already doing with Expansive? Um, are they the same? Are they different? How similar are they? Well, it's, you know, I... Um... When Perm I know Permian very, very well, and I know uh, I know CME very well, but I don't know. I, I haven't looked at that deal exactly, so I have to, I I, um, I saw it. It kind of passed by, and there was so much going on. It was a it was a busy a busy news week, so I, I can't I can kind of comment on it a bit. I think what they're doing, but I want to point out first of all that I you know I spent 15 years as managing editor of Ecosystem Marketplace, and we had the first global. Uh, carbon price, I think. I, I think anybody would agree with that. And CBL also, CBL always told us that our price was wrong, but uh, but uh, I they they weren't the first. But they they CB, CBL is one of the ones that I mentioned. What CBL is offering is a is, this the geo they call it, and then they have the NGO, and they're both the similar concept was that they take a global basket. The geo is a basket of, of offsets that, are, that meet the requirements for Corsia, which is the international aviation sector. And they just, it's any, you know, the thing is CBL is a, is a platform, a trading platform. So anybody can go and list on their platform. Uh, I don't know if anybody, but uh, you know, projects, you can list your project there. And, um, and uh, if, uh, and, 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 and sell your offsets that way. And for years, they, for years, their price, for, according to project developers was they were kind of a dumping ground because uh, um, they don't want to hear this, but uh, they've always disputed this. I'll, I'll point out, but uh, they, what I heard from project developers was we, you know, that, that um, they would, you know, the, most of these were negotiated bilaterally. You would have a big deal. You'd sell a bunch of offsets to Delta or some big airline. You'd have some remnants and you'd put them on CBL. What's happened in the last few years is CBL has become much more of an indicative market. So companies are putting their offsets on there first. I, I talked to on one of my episodes of my podcast, I talked to a guy named Gabriel Eikhoff, who talked about this about three, three months ago. He was trying to fill a big order for a client. And uh, he, he just he called his usual people and none of them had supply. He went on CBL and was able to fill it pretty quickly. So they do have a liquid market. And what they do for their global price is they take they take a they, they define criteria. They say, here is the lowest the lowest deliverable price for this basket of, of, of offsets. Um, and what we did at Ecosystem Marketplace, we were more of a call around market. We would just call people up and say, what are the prices? So we never had a market driven approach. And then, and again, I don't know what Permian is doing with, with ICE or with CME. I should, uh, with ICE, yeah, they're with ICE. I, I, I saw that announcement. Okay, so so we got we got this very interesting series of questions. The good news is that coming in the middle of January, we're going to be talking to Gordon Bennett of the Intercontinental Exchange, and Steve, mm -hmm. we're going to have a get chance to answer all those questions and get through exactly what's going on. So what I hear from you is that perhaps ICE aren't the per first people. Certainly, they aren't the first people to conceive of a global market. 
other people have had a global market of some sort previously, or at least a single price for carbon. But there's a degree of complication between the fact that the CME have certainly managed to get expansive to a point where they're doing a great deal of business. Well, that one's going to run and run. The invitation is out there to CME Expansive as well. They haven't responded yet as to whether they're going to be back. ICER already have thrown their hat into the fray to continue this discussion in January. So let's move on to a question, if we may. We're here today discussing, ladies and gentlemen, the market view from COP26 with climate expert Steve Zwick. He's an expert in carbon markets. So, Beate Young, fresh from her visit to the lovely coastal town of Portorosh in Slovenia last week for the SME Assembly, after an interesting series of insights by Professor, and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, I'm sorry, <laughs> Professor Lushka Kalfesh Bogotai, a Slovenian climatologist who gave a speech, a keynote speech at the SME Assembly, which was much reported last week. Would you agree with the thesis? that we should scale up investments in low energy by a factor of 500%, not 10%, oh, yeah. not 20 years, in order to mitigate the negative impact of climate. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know enough about the economics of, of energy, but um, you know, I think that's kind of a consensus is that we need to you know, ratchet up our investments in in uh, in or in, in renewable energy is the word term I would use, um, but also energy efficiency, I guess, might be what they're talking about. But I think, you know, we need to, and that's actually an argument. One argument for voluntary carbon markets too is that a lot of times the new new technologies are really expensive when they start, and if you can't get a subsidy, a carb, an off, you know, off, using offsets to provide a kind of de facto subsidy or a way to go about it. So I'd, I'd say, yeah, I'm not, again, that's not quite my, I, 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 uh, I report these kind of numbers. I don't uh, analyze them, but it, it makes perfect sense to me. And it's in line with what other people are saying. Fold investment jump in the very near future. Now we've got another really interesting question. We're jumping around here, Steve, giving you quite the runaround. One could almost see the idea that it might be me being vindictive for all those dodgy questions you asked me on Deutsche Welle Radio years ago. So we've got a fascinating input from Colin Howard, our old friend of this show and yeah. early guest on IPO Vid. Hey, Colin, good evening. Mm -hmm. It's lovely to see you this evening. If airlines paid bottom dredging and scallop fishermen to stop releasing carbon from the seabed, they'd offset the entire CO2 from flying. What are the chances of that happening, Steve? That's a slight geopolitical yeah. one for you thrown in there. Yeah, that's a, you know, I, I, I can't, I, yeah, I don't know enough about uh, that, the, about uh, the economics of fishing to know, but I will say that the oceans are, the next frontier, you know, healthy ocean management is, 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 is huge in this sector because of the, what I mentioned before, I mentioned the ability to grow uh, kelp and sink it to the bottom of the ocean. And there was an agreement signed in, in Glasgow or announced in Glasgow where the U S uh, joined a, a global consortium of other countries uh, agreeing to create a sustainable uh, seaside or, or a sustain, sustainable ocean economy and explicitly designed to, to do things like this. I just, I don't know uh, what, what the, uh, what the carbon content is that comes from the seabed. And I don't know what alternative methods there are, but I, I can say with, I mean, there's, you know, that, that, the using the ocean as, is is both taking better care of it. So that it's not releasing and also using it as a carbon sink. I mean, in addition to uh, kelp farming, uh, there's also whale carbon, which is this idea that if that if you can sink uh, whale carcasses in you know to the bottom of the ocean, when they you know basically you can you, you can uh, have a, a pretty unmeasurable impact. I mean, there's so many things on the oceans that we're just now getting into. I did an episode with uh, Steve Crooks, who is an expert on this area. And, it does get fascinating because every every alternative you look at um, does have it it does have complications and repercussions. I mean, this would obviously impact the uh, the the you know the livelihood of fishermen, but at the same time, there's already so much movement on the fishing front, fishing front with 
you know, um, cat shares and stuff like that, managing the seabed better. So I guess my long, it's a long way of saying, I don't know the answer, but it's intriguing. And yeah, sorry, Colin. I wish I had a better show. show. <laughs> it just goes to show there are so many options here for things There's that we so can much, do, yeah. which, which I have to say is something that the mainstream media doesn't seem to be very good at telling us because they keep telling us that the world ended 14 years ago. And well, there've been at well, least yeah, 13 yeah. or 14 cops since then. Yeah, I think they've, I, I'm pretty critical of mainstream coverage, although I think they underplayed, they focused on dire, uh, on, on, they overstated the certainty 20, 30 years ago. And then when the certainty was really certain, they understated it. And I think the problem I have with them right now is that I think there's a lot of coverage on these gee whiz funky things. I'm I've, I've actually seen a lot of stories on kelp farming, um, even though it's really the next generation but it's untested. It's just kind of cool and nifty. And there's a lot of coverage on Red Plus and nature-based solutions that are time-tested, have rigorous methodologies, and they're being attacked I, it, it, by a lot of media groups, I think only because they're, they're transparent. Because if you open a project dev design document from any one of these, you can, you know, they're, they're all based on probabilities. You can always find something to pick apart. So it's a little bit frustrating to me to see the way uh, mainstream coverage is is still i think they're still blowing it on the solutions front sorry <laughs> oh i can't so hear you sorry. Thought, okay i was thinking actually sorry production are a bit slow this evening the first thing <laughs> i was thinking was uh, there's also happens to be a minor argument going on in the street below me obviously somebody's uh Somebody's carbon offsets have gone slightly wrong in the, in the course of downtown Valletta this evening. <laughs> Certainly one of the things that struck me immediately was, well, the idea of sinking whale carcasses is brilliant. So what do you do? You put a big plastic bag inside them and flit it with, oh, no, hold on, plastic bags. Yeah, well, it's going to be that. tricky trying to get there. I mean, who, who on earth is going to be able to weave a very large grass basket that will hold sufficient weight of stuff that's <laughs> biodegradable in order to hold it down there for a long time? Clearly, there's research needed, but it, it's interesting nonetheless, the idea of kelp farming. And it's also also absolutely fascinating to see, as Colin Howard's talking about, the possibilities for tidal energy, which are totally being not exploited. Yeah. But then again, I mean, you know, we've just spent a month in the, in the Caribbean, and frankly, the amount of solar power that's being harnessed out there struck me as uh, pretty derisory, given the fact that it's well, as sunny as, as sunny as anywhere gets on Earth, uh, frankly. But thank you very much, Colin. Those are great questions and points all together. Thank you for saying it was really interesting. I agree. It's fascinating listening to Steve. And Steve's going to be back in the new year for some of these interviews that we're going to have with the major carbon playing exchanges. I should also mention at the moment that not only are we here discussing the market view from COP26 with Steve Zwick, but also you can catch Steve's podcast, The Bionic po Planet podcast, which is available from all the usual eco-friendly down downloadable sources. No paper is used in the production, therefore it's remarkably low footprint altogether, just voice and digital recording altogether from uh, Steve Sick. Very, very interesting, the topics that he covers at all points in time. So, We've got this carbon market at the moment, Steve. We've got lots happening in the scene, but at the same time, it strikes me, I mean, while there are certain catastrophists who are saying that the world is at one minute to midnight, which I'm not entirely convinced about, but given the amount of mitigation that's taken place already, we certainly are at a point where it looks to me like the automobile about 1893. I mean, it's barely discernible as the thing that the rest of the world will go on to drive for the next century and a bit. Yeah, I mean it's very it's it's very exciting right now. I disagree with that. I get I get pretty scared reading these IPCC reports. So um, I think we're, we're we're we are pretty close, but at the same time we're we're at an inflection point. Um, I did a, I hate to keep hyping my show, but I had a had one with Bronson Griscom, who is a, a lead scientist at Conservation International now. I think he was a TNC before, but he uh, we 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 talked about um, you know thirty years from now if we get all these nature based solutions up to scale and we get, and we get, and we, we really manage this energy transition, um, we could have ecotopia is the term he used, you know, ecotopia is out there as he put it, or, or we could be completely screwed. So I think we're, we're at this point where there's going to be a lot of change. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of legacy, um, 
you know, a lot of uh, legacy industries are going to are going to to suffer. A lot of companies that I mean, this is again going back to the first client Carney Task Force on climate uh, transition risk and com countries that are companies that are caught flat-footed are are, are going to be caught out. And th there's a lot of a uh, lot of um, evidence that some most CEOs still think they can just you know buy offsets and be done, which they can't, or they can wait until 2040 and reduce, which they can't. Um, I kind of went off topic there, but, but the, the, the industry is growing. The, the car carbon offsetting is really a key driver of this, but it's really a larger economy that, that this sector is meant to, to, uh, to produce. Did I, did I answer that question or did I go off on a tangent that <laughs> I think you went off on an educational tangent, Steve. I think you, you managed to, to do both things at the one time. I mean, here we are. We're, we're in a unique ecosystem, the Exchange Invest ecosystem, discussing our little niche community of markets the world over. We're looking at the whole market-based approach post-COP26 with Steve Vick, an expert in the field, who's also producer of his own excellent podcast, The Bionic Planet, which I thoroughly recommend as a great source of knowledge about the carbon markets and also the way the natural world can effectively heal itself with a great deal of prompting from our good selves. So, Steve, we're into the last 10 minutes of the show. If you've got a question, ladies and gentlemen, start now, because by this stage of the hour, usually we're running with the question feeds are about 45 seconds to a minute behind. So I don't want you to miss out if you've got a question to ask us. Thank you very much. Those have been asking already. Steve, what do you think are the most important things we need to see to improve the environmental markets now in the next five years? Um, let's see. I think we, we need we need transparency. We need comparability. Um, I think I think we're getting what we we need. We, we you know we we are getting. Um, and it's going to sound hokey, but we need what we needed was demand. That's what we didn't have before, and we have that. And I th and I think we need education on the part of the public too to understand what what is what's legit and what isn't. You know, there there's a there's an an interesting dynamic that's playing up right now too, uh, on both the nature based side and the industrial side, which is it, supplies are really. You know, we we for years we were in a demand side market. There was there were you know it was mostly green-minded entrepreneurs who really wanted to go out and uh, do good and and uh, and make make some money at the same time. So they created all of these projects and a lot of them were floundering and uh, a lot of them were on the brink of going under just a couple of years ago. Now suddenly we've got all this demand and there there there's a it, it's flipped and so there's a there's a big surge towards uh, you know toward, towards going out and, and meeting that demand. And the question is, will they will they meet it with quality? And I think that that's the thing that we need to do is to ensure, especially with land use, because land use is so complicated. We need to make sure that you know we're, we're getting verified, validated afforestation, reforestation projects, and not just playing some Yahoo to go plant a few trees. Um, you know, so so that we we need to make sure that people understand what what the difference is between a good a good offset, a good credit, and one that isn't going to do anything. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, so therefore standards, transparency, liquidity, accessibility. Well, hold on a second. Liquidity, accessibility, transparency. Somebody wrote a book about that 20-odd years ago, whatever <laughs> that might have been. The, the, whole, but the principles of, of what we need are the same as we need in all known markets. Yes. And we're talking about a 500% increase being suggested by the Slovenian academic. That almost seems at the conservative end of the oh, potential yeah. of what's there because you're talking about the product base firing all over the place. I was really interested, just give us a minute or two, a high level on some of these fascinating indigenous projects you were talking about in relation to forestry amongst certain tribes and other groupings. I mean, where in the world are they and, and what are some of them trying to do? Oh, they're all over the place. Um, there's in the United States, there's a tribe called the, uh, the Yurok people who went out and they did a, they did afforestation, reforestation, and improved forest management, which is where you take an area of forest that has not been managed well and manage it better, manage it more sustainably, and get credit for the, the extra carbon. And then they used the money from that to go and expand. They bought back some of their traditional tribal lands. There are groups in Kenya. Uh, in, in there's, there's, there are, there are 
um, aggregated small farmers, uh, smallholder farmers in Kenya who are implementing agroforestry. And what, what they're doing is by planting trees and among their crops, they're improving their yields. They're getting credit for the carbon that they sequester in the soil. Um, and, and they're also using the silage to feed their cows so they get they, they're, they, they get more milk per burp, you know, because cows, every time they burp, they emit methane. So they're not reducing the amount of methane that the cows are, are emitting, but they're, they're, um, they're, redu they're increasing the amount of milk they get per burp. And now they're adding new feed in that's made from uh, garlic and orange peels and seaweed and stuff and reduces the burp. So that's, that's another one. There are others. There's, there, there's um, another group in Kenya or no, there's a group in, in, uh, in uh, in uh, boy, there's so many. There's there's there 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 are tribes in 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 the Amazon who are doing Red Plus projects. Where what they're doing is Red Plus is you go out and you you identify threats to the forest and you you quantify it using approved methodology. So this is based on the activities we see. This forest is high risk of, of danger, uh, but if we can implement these methods we can save it. And a lot of tribes are embracing red plus. And a lot of times what they're doing is using the money to, to not only protect the forest, but to create new, um, new, uh, 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 you know, um, alternative lifestyles. It's, uh, yeah, they... So what they're creating, they're creating alternative lifestyles, they're creating new products, and they're also finding other ways to actually improve what they've already got, because you're making the key point about methane. And interestingly, I hear that once again, we're talking about seaweed. So it seems to me that kelp is suddenly the mega super yeah. product of the age, as it seems to solve pr pretty much everything. Soon it'll be, I don't know, they'll be bring, trying to bring it into the NBA under some sort of scholarship. <laughs> the, 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 that's a fascinating, I mean, it is really, really interesting. I, I'm not trying to be overly facetious i'm just trying to bring the points to life because it's so interesting so therefore steve you're going to put an e on this thing or possibly a carbon centric approach but as we ask everybody at the end of the show where do you think the capital market revolution goes next uh you mean within this sector or anywhere in the sector is good yeah i let's see where does it go next? Wow. I wish I had prep, prepped for that one. Mm -hmm. It could go in so many different directions. Um, on on nature-based solutions, I think it's going to go into what I just talked about. It's going to go into in the, the next, it's going to go into uh, cooperating with indigenous people. Indigenous people control so much of the world's forests and they really do have a history of good land management and they are under threat. And I think that we're, we're going to see there, there's a, a new movement towards market-based mechanisms that, that aren't off. It, it, there's a, complica a complication in dealing with indigenous people, which is to get credit, to do a Red Plus project, you have to show that the forest is, in, is under threat. And because indigenous people are protecting these areas, they, they often don't qualify but they're, they're starving to protect these areas. So there's a new move towards paying them to maintain the forest uh, based on what they call indigenous life plans, which have been evolving over decades. And this is an idea that's been around for a while, but there was never a corporate appetite and there was never a way to quantify the impact. One of the things that I saw in Glasgow is there's, there are new technologies that can make it possible to verify the biodiversity impacts, the water impacts, using, using sensors that pick up DNA in the air and the soil and the water. So you can see what kind of species uh, are, are on this land as well as what kind of carbon is there. And this, this, these kind of ecological benefits, um, it kind of goes to the old payments for ecosystem services thing, but, if, but they're, they're people, if, going beyond philanthropy and getting corporations to somehow support this, you know, as a way of uh, offsetting past impacts or winning, winning, uh, you know, uh, winning, you know, consumer approval, or conversely, also just improving their supply chain management, which is, we didn't even touch on that here, but there's yeah, there's a whole supply chain movement that is tangential to the carbon movement, and they kind of reinforce each other. Well, and it's it's that catastrophe of I mean, fifty percent of tomatoes don't manage to get to market in Egypt. Yeah. 
or for yeah, example. Right. And I mean, that's that's a pretty efficient market by comparison with the huge others. So so we've got this incredible supply chain revolution. We've got the huge opportunity for the products themselves. We've got an amazing opportunity within indigenous people. And you've been talking about those across good grief. It took you two minutes to cover three different continents there in, in one fell swoop, <laughs> whether it was the indigenous North Americans, people who were in the rainforest and also looking at all sorts of projects that were happening in Africa. So essentially, there's just one unbelievably huge opportunity here at the moment, as well as the fact that we have an incredible need for these particular products to grow and to make ourselves more efficient. We need more buy-in from the corporate sector. It's all based around a science, a philosophy, stuff that dates all the way back to William Nordhaus and uh, also Freeman Dyson in the 1970s with their groundbreaking original papers way before the 26 conferences of, of COP. And you discussed how we got all the way towards, well, places like Poland, and you were talking about Katowice, uh, which I'll pronounce uh, slightly, hopefully slightly better for the sake of our Polish producer <laughs> this evening, rather than Katowice, which sounded a bit to me like somewhere in Hawaii, Steve, I've got to say, we might have to work on that in the future. You're Polish, you? But it's so interesting looking also back and thinking about where we were in the 1990s, knocks and socks and acid rain. Who talks yeah. about acid rain these days? I I mean, that's one of the reasons why I happen to be an optimist in this thing, because notwithstanding the fact that we need to take action, nonetheless, we essentially managed to kill acid rain. And yeah. that was a good thing. It was long overdue. But certainly the Knox Sox acid rain thing that was being talked about 20 odd years ago is something that's disappeared. You've given us a great idea of everything through a multiplicity of different acronyms. ITMOS was one of my new ones for this evening. <laughs> We've tried to look at this idea of the global carbon price. And that's going to be something we're going to carry on this debate about all the way into the first quarter of next year. Ladies and gentlemen, we've already got the Intercontinental Exchange coming to talk about their products. Next week, we're going to have Capital Markets from Brussels with love with uh, Rosa Armesto Playa. She is the Deputy Director General of FESE, the Federation of European Securities Exchanges. It will be very interesting to hear her views, which I think are going to contrast somewhat from Jake Pugh, who was one of the very early guests on our show, and of course, an MEP for a period of time before Brexit. It only remains for me to say, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Zwick, this has been a fascinating show. We're really looking forward to having you back in the new year so that we can have these three-way discussions with the Intercontinental Exchange, with the Carbon Exchange, with also hopefully Expansive and other parties in the area of carbon markets and those who are trying to make an environmental difference. <laughs> Difference. Thank you very much to all those who contributed this evening. Simon Huckle, Colin Howard, Bata Young, Woman On It. We had an anonymous question from the IPO vid community as well. Steve Zick, thank you very much for watching. My name is Patrick L. Young. I also happen to be executive director of Valerium. So in that case, I wish you all another great week in life, blockchain and markets. Thanks for watching.